Uh, we are going to do something a little different tonight in terms of uh, our presentation where we're not going to be exegeting Scripture, but we're going to be explaining about how we got the Bible. Uh, so you will need your Bible. Near the end, I have a passage we're going to go through, but it's a little bit different that way. But before we get into what I have to share with you tonight, I will uh, open in a word of prayer, and then we'll dig in. Thank you, Lord, so much for your word. We know it is a word like no other. There is uh, nothing on earth compared to your word. It is divine. It is your word. It is uh, true. It is enduring. And it is transformative. Thank you, Lord, for the way the word has changed my life, how your words have brought healing, have brought conviction, have brought um, hope even. Lord, I know that, that the same is true uh, for many here, and we're so grateful for you revealing yourself to us. I pray tonight as we chat about the preservation of your word through the centuries, through the millennia really, that we would be informed, that we would understand better where the Bible came from in the process, how it got to us, and as a result we'd be better equipped to share its truth with others. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to think uh, Christianly, to think logically and to think honestly and to submit ourselves ultimately to your to your word in the end just want to pray as well lord for the uh things going on in the lives of different people here at connect and maybe extended family members that aren't well uh, we pray lord that your hand would be upon them and that they would be healed and that they'd be able to um, just be restored to full strength we pray for some of the the struggles that are going on perhaps that maybe not even voiced later on during our prayer time. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would bring conviction where necessary, would bring encouragement and strength uh, where necessary, and that our lives together as a people of faith would be enriched and that we'd be able to live and flourish and just draw attention back to you for your glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I brought something along with me tonight. I brought it to uh, connect in the past, but... It is a very, very old book. So I don't know what the oldest book that you have in your personal library is, but until a few years ago, I did not have very many old books. But then somebody at a thrift store was unloading items to the thrift store at the same time as me, and they had pulled their van door opener open and explained they were donating some Bibles. And I looked and I said, oh, that's interesting. And they said, would you like it? And so I didn't even have to pay for it at the thrift store. They just took it from one vehicle into the next. And this thing is incredible. It's from 1890, and it contains sections of the Bible, sections explaining the history of the Bible and translation, amazing um, illustrations, and it's just very, very cool. So it's available later if you want to thumb through it carefully. Uh, you're welcome to. And the reason I brought it up is because that helped me to realize just how careful you have to be with old books if you want them to last. And that's incredibly relevant for our discussion tonight because we are talking about how we got the Bible. So this is a four-part series we are doing. The first week we came and we talked about the fact that the Word of God is actually inspired. It is God-breathed and the importance of that, that God is the ultimate source of the Bible. We then talked about last week the process of canonization. In other words, the process through which the church recognized the divine source of the scripture. Uh, not the process where the church decided what would be divine and wouldn't be divine, but rather the process through which the church recognized it because the scriptures weren't written in one day. It was written progressively over 1,500 years by over 40 human authors. And so the church over time had to validate, is this from God or is this not from God? So there were some uh, things that the early church audience perhaps used to, uh, to determine that. One we mentioned from Deuteronomy, whether a, a prophecy came true or not. If it was a false prophet, it was supposed to be killed because a false prophecy was that bad. But we talked about the process of canonization. And today we're going to talk about the process of, or the, the wonder, I could say, of preservation. How it got from the early church who received it, or even before the early church, the people of Israel who received it, to today. And the reason this discussion is so important is because if you don't understand how we got the Bible, then you won't understand how to read the Bible. You won't understand what 
you can trust about the Bible or can't trust about the Bible, if there's parts you can't trust, you won't share it with others the same way. You won't even memorize it the same way. You won't know how to pick translations of the Bible. So next week we're going to talk about translations. That's going to be a fun discussion. But tonight we are answering how did it get to us, the wonder of preservation. There's lots of confusion here. A lot of people are confused. A lot of lies are said out there. Uh, There's lots of Christians also that just don't want to even explore this. They're like, I have an English Bible in front of me. I'm content not to ask any questions, mostly because they're uh, they're kind of afraid of opening the can of worms and not knowing what to do if they encounter something challenging or difficult. They figure it's easier to live naively than to explore and to ask the tough questions. And I just want to encourage you about this topic, as well as others, sometimes when we venture in the area of science, Christians are also a little nervous. They're like, oh, I'd just rather not be into science because they see it as a polar opposite to revealed truth from God's word. And the truth is, it's not. Oftentimes, unfortunately, people do science or do history or do textual criticism poorly and they end up coming up with poor conclusions or they have human assumptions baked into their processes that aren't revealed, and so the end product is what is uh, revealed as well, is revealed to be at conflict with Scripture. But it's not the scientific method that's the problem. It's not good history, historical study that's the issue, because God's truth is true, and we shouldn't be afraid, basically, of tackling the hard questions. And we might have to reach a point where we reach the limits of our human understanding, but I don't want us to be afraid of that. I think that's actually a terrible way to develop your faith, is just to hide from the hard questions. I think it's much better to ask the hard questions in Christian community, seeking those out, trying to figure out what we can know and where our confidence should lie so that we don't end up putting our foot in our mouths, saying stuff that's not even stuff Jesus would say, Uh, being confident of things that maybe we shouldn't be confident of. I've met some people I think I mentioned in a previous week in a Bible school class that were like, the King James Bible is the inspired word of God in the English. No Greek or Hebrew matters anymore. It's the inspired English word of God. And I had great issue with that, especially as we're studying and understanding how we got the Bible. We'll talk about that a bit more next week. But I think it's important for us to ask the hard question. So tonight we're talking about the wonder of preservation, and it is truly a wonder. We're going to face some uncomfortable realities tonight, though. Perhaps you've experienced some of these. Perhaps you haven't. So I just want you to brace yourself. Some of the stuff you might hear tonight might make you a little bit uncomfortable at first. And that's okay. I think I'm going to provide good answers to help you get through that. But I just want you to be prepared for that at first. And so I'm going to put it right to you at the beginning. When it comes to the Bible, the process of preservation, getting it to us today, one of the first things you need to know especially if you're going to talk to skeptics who are going to ask you this, is that we do not have in our possession any single original manuscript of the Bible. Okay? So when God spoke to Moses, the Ten Commandments, actually he gave the Ten Commandments on stone and they put them in the Ark of the Covenant and delivered them to the temple eventually. We don't have those anymore. Surprise, surprise. You would have probably seen them somewhere. Uh, We don't have, when Jeremiah and Baruch, his scribe, were writing down the words that God told them to write, we don't have that piece of parchment or that papyrus or whatever they wrote on at that time, the, the, the vellum perhaps, the animal skins. We don't have that writing that Jeremiah actually touched or Baruch actually touched. When Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians, to the Galatians, to the Corinthians, and he wrote on papyri or he had his amanuensis, a scribe, write, we don't have that piece of parchment, piece of paper. But that does not mean we don't have the contents of it but you just need to know we don't have the original manuscripts, which we actually properly call the autographs. Kind of like thinking getting an original autograph. So you'll hear me reference manuscripts later on. Those manuscripts are copies of the autographs, but we do not have those manuscripts. So that's important to know. I can remember being told this and being a little bit shocked because I had been told as a teenager The Bible is very trustworthy. We have over 5,700 manuscripts of the New Testament. Manuscript fragments, 
manuscript pieces that testify to the validity of the New Testament. So what, I don't know how I even thought this, but somehow I thought there was 5,700 like original, but that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> There's not 5,700 original pieces of the Bible, but I, I, I can remember being kind of shooken by that. I was comforted by the fact, and if you've watched The Case for Christ, you've heard these stats put out. I was comforted by the fact that this is far more manuscript evidence than any other ancient writing. So one of the ones I brought along tonight as an example was Caesar's Gallic Wars. It was written in the first century BC. There are only 10 manuscripts of that in existence, and the earliest textual evidence we have was copied 1,000 years after the original. So you think Caesar's Gallic Wars were written 100 BC. It wasn't until 900 AD that we actually have a copy, and then we only have 10 copies. So compare that to the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, where we have 5,700 plus fragments, manuscripts, some larger than others, and you're like, whoa, like we have way more, but they are not the original autographs. So just know that. Know that out the gate. I actually think there's a reason why I think God did this to protect us from idolizing a piece of paper because this happened in the Old Testament with Gideon's ephod. Uh, the people started going after the object. It was meant as a blessing, but they totally treated it idolatrously. And I think this is what would happen uh, today if people actually found the Ark of the Covenant, found the Ten Commandments on two uh, tablets. These materials that they were written on originally, I mentioned these last week, I believe, that obviously Ten Commandments were written on stone. So that should last a long time. Except the Ten Commandments were put in the ark, they were put in the temple, and eventually the Babylonians came and destroyed and laid siege to everything. We don't know what happened to the ark unless you watch Indiana Jones. Then you are certain that it's in some U.S. warehouse somewhere and it's just waiting to be, to be found or opened, and then your faces melt, or something like that, which was a pretty wild scene. But anyways, we don't know what happened with the ark. We don't know what happened with it, but we know we don't have that today. Uh, some of the things on papyri, on animal skins, it, they break down. Again, how many books do you have that are even over 50 years old? And if you've read the books, and you go through them, I have, I have this nice set of um, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, by C.S. Lewis. And we got this nice box set. I was so thankful. And then one of my kids spilled a drink on one of the books. And now it's swelled and it's miscolored. And I'm like, ah, come on. This isn't going to be an heirloom to pass on to our children uh, and our grandchildren. Well, I guess it might be. It just, now it's got the stains, right? But you think about that. You think about scrolls that would be read, that would be read to the people of God. They would be used because that's why you write things down, to use it. So used for hundreds of years, and the estimates some have is that they could last up to 500 years a scroll, like Isaiah's scroll perhaps could last 500 years, but even at that, I think that's probably pretty generous being used. And so likely what ended up happening, well, what we know happened is they made copies of it to ensure that they would not get, the message would not get lost. God did preserve the text, just not the way that you might have thought. But what's concerning for many people is the copies of the copies. Okay, so you have an a original message, you have a copy of that, then you have copies of the copies, and the copies of the copies of the copies. And if you've ever played the game Telephone, you know how this could work, right? You play the game of Telephone, and the reason you play it is because it's hilarious what comes out the other end. You're whispering and trying to transmit the message, and it is bizarre sometimes. It is, I think we played it at Connect, actually, a while back, and it was bizarre. I'm like, how did it even come out the other end? And so this is why some very famous critics, like Bart Ehrman, and when you just hear his name, just think Error Man, okay? He's He's, a, he's all about the errors of the Bible, and he's in error about the errors of the Bible. But this is his name. He is a prolific Christian critic. He criticizes the Bible a lot. And the reason for that is largely because he, makes, he, he thinks it's ridiculous that we're trusting an inspired text that's based on copies of copies of copies of copies. He actually wrote a book, of, a pretty well-selling book, I understand, called Misquoting Jesus, and said something to this effect. What good is it to say that the autographs, i.e. the originals, were inspired? We don't have the originals. 
We have only error-ridden copies, and the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals and different from them in thousands of ways. So he says, okay, you want to uphold the doctrine of inspiration, which Christians do. We do. We talked about that week one. The doctrine of inspiration I made sure to mention was the uh, autographs, the original autographs. I don't want to say the ESV itself is inspired to the point that you would say, oh, that comma, that word, right? We want to be careful. So we say the original autographs. Well, Bart, he says, that is no use to us if we don't have a solid transmission line. And he's right in the sense that if you don't have copies of copies that are accurate, then what use is your doctrine of inspiration? It's kind of theoretical. It was inspired for them when they received it, but for us, there's no way we have any representation of that. Unfortunately, Mr. Ehrman has made a lot of claims. There's a mixture of truth, like we don't have the originals, but there's a lot of errors as well, or there's a lot of misrepresentation in his statement. So we're going to address some of these as we go through them, because if you're on YouTube at all, and you're searching a textual criticism, he's gonna, his name's going to pop up. And you're going to watch some of his videos, and he might look friendly, and he might look interesting and intelligent, but he's very dangerous because of what he actually proposes. And he's also, because of that, wrong. Or not because of that, he is wrong, and because of that, he is dangerous. So, what we do have today, it's going to be a little bit more complicated process to explain next week in terms of translation, but I brought along my Greek, or sorry, my Hebrew text, of the Bible and my Greek text. These are what we used in seminary to study and to translate from. And so you can go through and look and it's got all kinds of scribbly marks that you, you don't understand until you learn Hebrew and Greek. And it's a very interesting process. But these, okay, these represent for us the, the source of our English translations. So how do we get these? Well, that's the process of the copies of the copies of the copies of the different texts. So I want you to give, to give you an example of how meticulous the scribes were in copying those copies. It wasn't anything like the game of telephone, just, just to give you a clue. So there's a group in the 7th to 10th century called the Masoretes. And I'm, this is just one that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you one other one as well. But this kind of gives you a sampling. The Masoretes were responsible for copying, and they were super meticulous about this, especially they were meticulous about Hebrew. Okay, and what you need to know about Hebrew is when it was originally written, it's only consonants. There's no vowels originally in Hebrew when it's in written form. There's vowels in how it's pronounced, but they would just write, like, take, the, take a word without the vowels. So the word word, W-R-D. And they would just know it's word, right? And so the Masoretes were very, very meticulous about copying all the consonants. And so what they would do when they were copying at the end of each book, they would put a little section where they would type out the number, or not type, write out the number of consonants in that book. So, like the number of letters in that book. And so they would put that number at the end, and then when you watch copy to copy, you're like, that has 3,000 letters, consonants. This one has 3,000. Okay. Well, at least they got the number of letters right. A lot more likely that they're going to get it proper. They would also then mark out the middle character of the entire book and note where that was and what letter it was. So at least you know to halfway point then you got your text proper. Uh, and they would do a whole bunch of mathematical equations like this. It was very, very meticulous that the Masoretes would do. And it was uh, also important to them to help preserve the vocalization, how the words were said, but they didn't want to mess with the text. So what they did is they put points, they, if you take a line of the text of Hebrew, they would take points and put them above and below the text and then train you how to interpret those points to, trans, or to vocalize the text. So when you learn to read Hebrew, you learn what the little dots below it mean, what the little line that looks like a T is, how those sound and make the, the text sound. But they don't mess with the actual consonants of the text. Pretty cool. They also would put in the margins, and you can see it if you look up later, but they would put in the margins in the Masora all their, all their notes and notations, variant readings. Sometimes they would come across a text and they'd be like, you know what, that probably isn't, the, we probably received a copy that had some kind of a scribal error in it, 
Perhaps they, they conjoined words that they shouldn't have because it's kind of hard when you have no vowels and no capitals. How do you know when a word ends and starts? No question marks, no periods. So there's some of those things, but they wouldn't change it. They would just note it in the side, in the margin, so that future people could look and they'd be like, oh, that probably is a scribal error. So the Masoretes did this and they did it meticulously and it's, it's impressive what they have, they have accomplished. Interestingly, this is a little sidebar, but just so that you know, the Masoretes in the end, around the 10th century, somewhere around there, uh, they, there was one specific guy named Ben, no, Asher Ben Asher. Okay, he's kind of like the, the end of the Masoretes and his text that he, his manuscript that he uh, collected and translated, in the, or not translated, collected and put together is ended up being called the Masoretic text. So if you ever run across MT or Masoretic text, that's from the Masoretes. And his text became what's called the Aleppo Codex. You may come across that sometimes, the Aleppo Codex. Codex is a fancy word for book, basically. It's just before books were actually a thing. So in between scrolls and our modern day binding process were codexes, where it was bound on one edge, and that was called a codex. So the Aleppo Codex was the Mater Masoretic text. And the Aleppo Codex was our, our most complete translation, or not translation, our most complete copy, uh, manuscript copy, you could say, of the Hebrew Old Testament. And wouldn't you know it, only in 1947, unfortunately, as a result of some anti-Jewish riots, 40% um, I believe of the Aleppo Codex was destroyed by a fire, which is really, really sad. Um, and so now the Leningrad Codex is the most recent one we have from a few decades newer than that. But the Aleppo Codex um, was based off of the Masoretic text and was a representation of the Hebrew Old Testament. I'm gonna tell you about another group of scribes. So we got the Masoretes from the seventh to 10th century, really, really particular. There was also a group in the first to third century that was also pretty particular. The Tanaim, I'm not quite certain how to pronounce it. They served again at 100 to 300 AD and it was said of them that when they copied, no word was allowed to be copied by memory. You weren't allowed to be like, oh, I'm gonna look at there, memorize, oh, I'm just gonna, you had to, one for one, translate across. If more than three mistakes, mistakes being like, oh, you put a line somewhere you shouldn't, whatever that kind of thing, if more than three mistakes were made on any page, it was destroyed and redone. If you have ever written out a page of the Bible by hand, I dare you to do it. I actually have written out several of the books of the Bible by hand as an exercise. It's fun to do because it helps to ingrain it in your head, but man, is it hard to do it properly. Punctuation, capitalization, spelling, it's very, very difficult. So just imagine, they're doing this and they don't have the same kind of resources we have in terms of infinite amount of paper and pen. It was very, very expensive. But if they made a mistake, they would scrap it and start over. And so this is the pattern you see of the scribes over and over and over and over again. And I'm gonna give you some details in a bit to show just how true that is. Now, they weren't always perfect, obviously. That's why Bart Ehrman finds errors. That's why we have found errors in the text, okay? That's why it's helpful for us to have multiple textual sources. So when the copies get made, think, think of like a family tree almost. You have the, the, fa the head of the, the tree, which is the original, but then there's two copies made and those copies get dispersed and copies of those copies get dispersed and they get dispersed all over the Mediterranean basin. Some end up in Egypt, some end up in uh, Greece, some end up in Rome, some end up in Jerusalem or Israel. All those copies, when you start to bring them together and compare them, then you start to see, oh, the patterns. And we'll talk about that more, but there were some big groups that ended up together that we want to, uh, to talk about. So we talked about the Masoretic text, that's from about 900,000 AD. So that's quite a lot separated uh, considering the Old Testament is written before the time of Jesus. Another key witness of the Old Testament is the Samaritan Pentateuch. So the Samaritans were a interesting group that started because they started, in, a group of Jews started intermarrying with the people that were the, the Gentiles. They weren't supposed to do that. They started doing that around the Assyrian um, invasion in the 700s BC. But the Samaritans only held to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
and they had their own version, you could say, of the Bible that was copied, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and we have records or fragments of that. The Samaritan Pentateuch, interestingly, was modified from the Old Testament slightly, in small ways. So they added a Tenth Commandment to the Ten Commandments. They combined two of the commandments and made a tenth one that said you should worship on Mount Gerizim because the Samaritans didn't worship in Jerusalem. So the Samaritan Pentateuch is kind of helpful, but there's some obvious errors there because they twisted it for their own purposes, which is obviously sinful and not proper. But it is interesting that you have, okay, we can see another illustration of what uh, is happening when people are copying. Another key witness, I mentioned it previously, it was a Septuagint. So before the time of Jesus, people had translated the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And we have fragments of that. And so we can look at that and see. Now, the Septuagint in the translation, Jesus quoted from. So that gave us information that Jesus, A, affirmed the Old Testament was the word of God. But B, also, it's interesting, this will be useful in our conversation next week, Jesus used a translation of the Bible, which affirms to us the value of translation. There's some that would say, no, you just got to go back to Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. But there's actually value in translation. So the the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, interesting. Uh, The Greek Septuagint, also interesting. One I'll mention now, and I know this is a little bit like history stuff, a little bit heady and maybe not interesting to everybody at the same level, but it has applications, so just hang with me a bit. Another big uh, source, you could say, is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hopefully you've all heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the 1940s, 1946, and this was a remarkable discovery, huge, huge discovery. So remember I mentioned the Masoretic text? That's our most, I guess you could say, recent manuscripts of the Old Testament, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls moved the timeline back a thousand years. Okay, so they look at the scroll of Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls, written perhaps 1-200 BC, this scroll. That moved the needle back basically to say, okay, our most recent manuscripts, a thousand AD, now it's time of Jesus or even before the time of Jesus. What's the coolest part, though, is when they discover these scrolls, then they start comparing them to the Masoretic text. And they go and they do one of these, and they're like, this is incredible. So incredible. The lining up, word for word, that they go through. And there are differences, but hugely inconsequential. Hugely, like, this is absolutely, when people, when people started finding it and reading it and seeing it, They're like, this is incredible. It is so, so incredible how similar, which shows the scribal traditions of copying to be what they were from that time. So super, super neat. I found one source that said that Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls could have possibly even been copied directly from Isaiah's scroll. I find that a little bit doubtful because Isaiah wrote some probably 700 years before the time of Christ, at least. Uh, And so... For the scroll to last like two, 500 years, it's possible. I don't know. We don't know that, so that's conjecture. But very, very interesting how the Dead Sea Scrolls found, okay, that moves the needle very, very much back so that we know with assurance what we have is actually representing what Isaiah wrote, what Moses wrote, etc. A couple of other ones I'll mention. Uh, the de- so the Dead Sea Scrolls I mentioned. Uh, okay, I mentioned all that. The Ketef Hinnom amulets, these are one of my favorite, okay? This is just a tiny, tiny little thing that was found, and it was, it's a, a little, almost like a, a necklace thing that you would put on people when you would bury them, and it's a silver amulet that was found in Jerusalem, I believe, uh, that contained inscription of the verses from Numbers chapter 6, the, the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you, may his face shine upon you. And that dates from the 7th century B.C., before Christ. So this is by far the oldest thing we have that attests to the historicity of the Bible. A a small fragment, you might be like, oh, that's not a big deal. No, it's really, really cool that we have this Ketef Hinnom amulets. You can look it up later. It's it's totally fun. Okay, now that was Old Testament stuff. I'm going to talk briefly about the New Testament, a little bit of textual criticism stuff, and then some application. So, 
The New Testament is much closer in timing. Uh, we have the first complete Greek codex, the Greek book of the New Testament is from the 4th century. I'll say the names, you don't have to remember them, but just, it's kind of cool. So Codex Sinaiticus, that one was from the 4th century. After that we have Codex Vaticanus, guess where that one's held? In the Vatican, <laughs> right? Uh, we also have, it's from the 4th century, then from the 5th century AD we have Codex Alexandrianus, Alexandrianus. So we have, from very shortly after, a couple hundred years after, we have complete New Testament Greek. I think actually some of them actually had the Old Testament in Greek as well. Uh, so pretty neat that way. But what's really interesting is that we have fragments of the New Testament that are way older. Not complete one books, but fragments that are way older. So we live in Windsor, Ontario. Windsor has no fragments in it that I'm aware of. Okay, But in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is about an hour drive, right? In Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the University of Michigan, they have a collection of papyri called the Chester Beatty Papyri. Half of it's here in Ann Arbor, and the other half's, I believe, in Europe somewhere. And that Chester Beatty Papyri is called P46. So if you look P46 up later, you can look it up. It's the uh, it's copies of the Apostle Paul's writings to Rome, verses from Ro his word, letter to Romans, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, First and Second Corinthians, Thessalonians, and also Hebrews, which is interesting because then maybe Paul did write Hebrews. We're not sure. Uh, but P46 dates from about 175 to 225 AD. So Paul wrote probably somewhere between 49 AD to 60. We're not quite sure exactly where in, but very, very much the second part of the first century. And we have about 100 years later copies of his letters, which is super cool, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So I'm not allowed to go see them on my own. I have to take a school. So I'm trying to figure out a way if I can like classify our classical academy here as a school that gets to go and see them, I'd be, it'd be neat. Apparently they get put out on display maybe publicly once a year or something as well. I haven't found it yet, but I, I wanna go over and I wanna see them. I think it'd just be so neat to see them. I'm, I'm really ashamed. I was in Bible school in 2009 and the Dead Sea Scrolls were in Toronto and I did not go see them. I was such an idiot. Why did I not go see them? Not that we worship them, but just to be able to understand the historicity of the Bible and see it uh, in hand. So that's Papyri 46 in Ann Arbor, Michigan, super close. But there's one that's closer to the date of the writing of the New Testament. And the earliest one we have is Papyri 52. It's called the Rylands Library Papyrus. Uh, it's about the size of a credit card. You can see that on like glass. Uh, it's kind of in the middle of a glass plaque. And it contains the verses from John 18, 31 to 33. And it's possible they don't have the exact date because it's not like the papyri wrote, like, dated <laughs> something. But based on their dating methods, they figure it could be anywhere from 100 AD to 150, 175 AD. So it could be as close as within 20 or 30 years of John writing John. Like, super cool. Within 50 years, very likely, that we have this copy of what John wrote. So again, when you're talking New Testament manuscripts compared to any other ancient document, guys, incredibly close in time, incredibly vast in the number that there are, uh, but yes, there are some differences among them. Partially, the reason there's so many differences is because there's so many manuscripts. When you have 5,700 plus manuscripts, you're gonna have a couple of errors or differences as you go through them. Now, this is where I'm gonna uh, just tell you a little bit about those errors. You can dive into this more if you go to websites like gotquestions.org or if you have a ESV study Bible. I know there's a good article in there. There's lots of great resources online. And I have some books up here as well I'll mention later. But some of these errors are things like when in, in the uh, Hebrew I mentioned they don't have vowels, right? So sometimes words got pushed together and sometimes words got separated or letters got separated. Sorry, yeah, sometimes letters got pushed together, sometimes letters separated, and it made uh, for errors. Now, sometimes later scribes could copy and realize, oh, that's an error like the Masoretes did, and okay, note it in the, mes the Masora, we're going we're gonna to note this error. Uh, but sometimes it's a word switching, like you get Jesus Christ, and then it says Christ Jesus. 
So it doesn't affect the meaning, but it's different, and we should note it. In Greek, sometimes one of the common things was to have a, an N, a new, uh, a movable new that would be to drop out or put in. So not quite, but similar to how we sometimes say a dog and an ear, like a-n, depending if it's a vowel at the beginning. So sometimes that would happen in the wrong place, and it's actually, the ESV Study Bible has a great article and points out that some of these errors are so hilariously unrealistic. It's like, clearly they put the N in and it wasn't supposed to. So one of them, in 1 Thessalonians, it says that we were horses among you, is what it translates to in one of the manuscripts. But it, it's because one letter change makes it, we were gentle among you. And it's like, we were gentle among you like parents with their children. So it's like, we were horses among you or we were gentle? Well, okay, it's an error, but it's because the N, it's obvious, everybody knows, okay? Sometimes the scribes updated language uh, to be more understandable so that it's not technically an error, but a change. So in English, I'll give you an illustration. In English, if I was to say, I want food, that would mean I desire food. But if you rewind the clock a couple hundred years and you say, I want food, it'd mean I lack food. And it's like, well, that's not helpful. So this is why English translations have to change because language changes and people change how they use those words. And some of them we have to be careful and protect. And some of them, the word want, you don't need to say, I want for snacks, right? I lack for snacks. I I want snacks, whatever. Who cares? We just change. And as long as we understand the meaning behind that exact word and translate it into an appropriate meaning in the context. So, These are some of the errors, that's touching on a few of them, but some of them are a bit more substantial. And so there's a field called textual criticism. Okay, and textual criticism, the goal of it is to understand from all these manuscripts we have what the most likely original autograph is. Remember, we don't have the autograph, but if you find 10 manuscripts that all say the same thing from 10 different regions of the world over different periods of time, you're like, okay, well, we can be very, very, very certain that the autograph said that as well. So there's three different fields of thinking with textual criticism, and this will be relevant for our discussion on translations next week. But the textus receptus is one approach, I guess you could say, where Erasmus in 1500s, he took the manuscripts available to him at that time, and he put them together, and that's the textus receptus. So this is now the TR which is the basis for the King James uh, translation, I do believe. The next one is the majority text. So it takes today, looking at all the manuscripts we have, and we say, which is the majority? That's the one we're going to go with. So if 10,000 manuscripts say this, and two manuscripts say that, well, we go with 10,000. And it, essentially, that's what it does, kind of majority rules. The final way of approaching it is to go with the eclectic text, which sounds kind of weird, but it's actually probably the best one, uh, where it's weighted by region, by number of copies, by likelihood of being explained, by consistency across regional dispersion, etc. So what this means is, uh, I think it's in the east, there was quite, this may not be your east, uh, but east, um, there was quite a lot of copies made. And some areas didn't get as many copies made. So just by sheer number, the fact that in the East they made more copies doesn't necessarily mean that it's the better um, representation of the original. And so the eclectic text approach basically looks and says, okay, which which approach, first of all, which manuscripts are the oldest? Because which manuscripts are often the shortest? Because it's more likely that people add to put in things, to explain the text, uh, which manuscripts perhaps uh, don't have those spelling errors or those those, uh, things that could be easily explained. So like the horses one, where it's like, we were like horses among you. If there's 10 that say that, but there's two that say we were gentle among you and gentle among you is clearly in the context, then you're like, well, this one obviously spurred on a whole bunch of bad copies. That kind of thing. Um, So the eclectic text is, in the end, what a lot of our translations that we use today are based off of. They would include recent discoveries from the Dead Sea Scrolls. They would take these and they would uh, include them. So what I want you to do now is take your Bible, 
and open it for a second to Mark chapter 16. And I'm going to show you why this kind of stuff matters. Okay, Mark chapter 16 and verses 9 to 20. If you look in your Bible, it's a good Bible if it has a little superscription around this area, okay? And says this, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Interesting. If you read through Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, it includes things like verse 18, or verse 17 and 18, and these will be the signs accompanying those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Could be true. It's kind of interesting. It's saying, ah, oh, this is a sign, they'll drink poison, it'll be fine. Now, the Apostle Paul did get bitten by a snake and it didn't kill him, so it's possible that this is actually meant to be in the the Bible, but it's quite possible that this section is not actually. So if you were to remove it, it would not take away from the meaning of Scripture. There's two places in Scripture that this happens. Mark 16 is one, and just you can look it up later, John 7, verses 53 and following. There's also a section there. So this is where the King James is going to have it, and it probably, I don't even know, you may, if any of you have the King James, tell me after, um, it may say something about the earliest manuscripts not containing it, but it very likely doesn't, whereas the ESV would say that. And so we have them there more because of church tradition. We're like, we're, we're not quite sure. But here's what I would do. I wouldn't build a doctrine off of it. I wouldn't build, stake my faith off of those two texts. But that does not undermine my confidence in the remainder of Scripture. It does not make it um, such that I can't trust that this is the Word of God. Because, overwhelmingly, what we have is consistency across time in the copies of the copies of the copies distributed all throughout the Mediterranean basin that attest to the preservation of God's word. Interestingly, when you approach, you, you find somebody that wants to find errors in the scriptures and point to that as reason to not believe the scriptures, there's actually something else going on. Because they don't distrust Caesar's Gallic Wars because Caesar's Gallic Wars don't have any impact or bearing on their life, whereas the Word of God does. So there's absolutely no question among any real, genuine, historical Greek scholar as to whether the New Testament reflects the, the New Testament that was handed down by um, the disciples about the death and resurrection of Jesus. No, they're, not. they're questioning whether it's true whether they, the disciples lied when they wrote, but they're not just questioning whether the disciples actually wrote that. Um, interestingly, Mr. Ehrman, who I mentioned, error man, I just think it's so true. That man now is a, what he would call a agnostic atheist. He grew up in the church, and he grew up going to Moody Bible Institute, the same school that I went to for my master's. He went to for undergrad, and he encountered some of this stuff. And it threw him into a tailspin, really. Uh, but it, it's thrown him off. And he, he thinks he's following an intellectual journey where he's being faithful to it. But now he denies whether you can even know that God exists. An agnostic is somebody who just says you can't know. And basically he takes the default position of there is no God. I, I, you just cannot know. When creation shouts that there is a God... It shouts there's a God. So even if you were to take the Bible out of the picture, which I wouldn't recommend, specific revelation, you still will walk away if you are not hardened in your heart knowing that there is a God because creation shouts that there's a God by the design of our, our world. But he is living in agnosticism. And so unfortunately, he has spiraled into chaos as a result. And he has uh, taken down a lot of people with him. I want to finish... Our, our message here by looking at a little case study of how God preserves his word from Jeremiah. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Jeremiah uh, chapter 36. And there, there I want to show you in history how God preserved his word then and is into preserving his word. So Jeremiah chapter 36 verse 1, it says, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. 
Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. Verse 4, Jeremiah then called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. That was a lengthy process, an expensive process. I'm sure not fun either because of the message he was delivering. Scroll down to verse 22, just eyes on the page, down to verse 22. It was the ninth month, and the king was sitting at the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him, as Jehudi read three or four columns of Jeremiah's letters, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Great. Jeremiah writes a scroll under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Baruch, really, under the dictation of Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what's the king do with it? Burns it. Verse 27 What happens? Is God's word going to be preserved or going to be erased? Now, after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Take another scroll scroll, and write on it all the former words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. So I just want you to see that. I think it's so fascinating. God's word is delivered. It's destroyed. But God's like, no, I'm not going to let my word be destroyed. It's preserved. Other ways it's preserved through the Babylonian destruction. Ezra collects, perhaps there's through some oral tradition. But one way or another, God's word preserved. It, it's eternal and it will not return void. And so what I've given tonight is hopefully some good apologetics or some good evidence for the historicity of the Bible, understanding how it's been preserved. What I want you to know at the end, just like we said last week in many ways, at the end, you're still going to reach a point where you can have assurance mentally, okay, this is the process of how we got the Bible, but you're going to have to cross the bridge of trusting, okay, this is the inspired word of God, and I'm going to live like it's the inspired word of God. Um, I can tell you, I can preach it to you, I can (laughs) hit you over the head, which I don't prefer to do. Um, But at the end of the day, it is is a, will you receive the word of God as the word of God? I think probably many of us have experienced the word of God as the word of God, and that is powerful. uh, And the spirit within us confirms as we read what the spirit has revealed. Um, But hopefully some of what I've I've unpacked for you is helpful um, as we just think through the historicity of the Bible. So back to Mr. Ehrman, his quote. He said, what good is it to say that the autographs were inspired? Well, it's a lot of good. He says, we don't have the originals. That's true. He says, we only have error-ridden copies. Hmm. We have lots of copies with errors that are not of significance to the actual meaning He says the vast majority of these are centuries removed from the originals. Well, that's true, but we have some that are very, very close that align right up. And historically, you don't got anything else that's even on par with the scriptures and different from them in thousands of ways. Yeah, there's thousands of differences. And again, you go do the research and you're going to find the message hasn't changed. You're going to find a lot of them scribal errors that are very, very easily explained. And there's a few like that Mark 16 passage too, really, where it's like, wow, what do we do with these? And that's, that's a serious question, and, and you might have to wrestle through that. But it's not something to undermine your faith in the Word of God. 